Jeremiah chapter 20. We're going to be starting at verse 7. O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily, even one mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. For I heard the defaming of many, fear on every side, report, say they, and we will report it. All my families watched for my halting, saying, pre-adventure, pre he was, or he will be enticed and we shall prevail against him, and we shall take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a mighty trembling one. Therefore, my persecutors shall stumble, and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed, for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten." The title of the message this morning is The Impressible Word. The Impressible Word. I have to admit that Jeremiah is one of my favorite prophets. It's mainly because of what he went through. What he's seen. What he endured. And a lot of times I relate the things that have happened in my ministry and seen other preachers have gone through similar things and I can see that it has touched them in the same way. But here we have the prophet as he relates to a little bit of personal testimony. He was a man of like passion with us. He tells how he decided once upon a time to quit preaching. I'll just state right now, I do not agree. You don't quit preaching. So the Lord ordains you, put you into a church. You may change churches, but you don't stop. Now, many times I feel like I wanted to quit and stop. But then the Lord has blessed in a way that I've been able to continue on. So I get discouraged like Jeremiah got discouraged. I get upset like Jeremiah got upset. So this is, this was Jeremiah's complaint in verses 7 through 11. And I don't hold it against Jeremiah for complaining. I complain too. And I imagine there's other preachers that have complained also with the situation they find themselves in. The first point I want to make this morning, he was enticed by the Lord. And the word deceived should be translated enticed or persuaded. And you can see that in the margin there for verse 7. God can induce, but never deceives. Jeremiah hesitated to accept the divine call to begin with. As many preachers have, and I am included in that, I said, no way, no how, never happened. But God has a way. And if you're truly saved and truly filled with the Holy Spirit, he will change your mind in an instant. But go to chapter 1 of Jeremiah and look at verse 4. 
Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So much for free will. Then said I, O oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not. I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Now, just stop there for a minute. You're all facing me. You don't see the faces. I see the faces. And I know how those faces react. And I have seen that over 35 years or more. And I see how they react. I read body language. I read how the message is received or not received. I know whether or not it's penetrating to the heart or not penetrating to the heart. I can tell you the ones that look away and don't want to hear it. I mean, I've experienced that. God said, don't be afraid of their faces. Don't worry about what they look like or what they're thinking. Then he said, the Lord, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. So God overpowered him by the influence of his spirit. He overruled his plans and told him he must preach. He seems to forget the words of God spoken in the beginning of his ministry. Going back to verse 1 there, or chapter 1, look at verse 19. He says there in verse 19, and they shall fight against thee. So he's already warned them what's going to take place. But they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. Be strong and of good courage, as Brother Lonnie told us Wednesday, was what was told to Joshua by God. Sold me the same thing. I had preachers telling me the same thing. Be strong and of good courage. In my de deepest, darkest time and hours, I would console with them and they would remind me that God was with me. John 16. John 16 verses 1 through 3. These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. Paul, ring a bell. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. That's why they do it. So again, God laid hold upon him and he was overcome. If you can get out of preaching, please do so for not. For God never called you. And I've seen many that is apparent. And I'm not judging them. It's just apparent. 
When you sit there and you listen, it's apparent that it's not from God. The problem we face today, I was talking to Brother uh, Brother Sexton about Brother, and Brother Bill about Brother Tiber and the church up there in Burton. When they ordained a man, Brother Tiber was very strict. And he said, I remember Brother Leninger telling me this. I didn't know him at, at that time yet. He said he would hand out a folder. He said, this is what you need to know. Well, until I got a hold of it, I realized where it came from. It was from uh, T.P. Simmons, Systematic Study of Bible Doctrine. And he had that whole thing covered. And if you didn't come right down the line, Brother Tiber would speak up and say, I'm not recommending you. That's not what's happening today, folks. They may not like it, but I call these guys panty waist preachers. They're not, they don't have the, the nerve to tell people the facts and the truth. And we've got ministers out here that should have never been ordained. It's just a fact. And I hate to say that amongst our own kind. If you don't feel that they should have been ordained, then you need to speak up. You need to say that's the time to do it. That's the time to tell the church. I cannot recommend this man to you at this time. It doesn't mean never at this time. We see there in verse 7 that Jeremiah, he was, a, he was mocked by men. Now, if you're in the ministry, that's what's going to happen can almost take it to the bank. The man overcome by God was overcome by mockers. God's servant often experienced unjust censor and false accusations. Look at 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Second Chronicles chapter 36, look at verses 15 and verse 16. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Jeremiah experienced this because the king at that time was listening to the prophets that weren't God's prophet. Jeremiah went back to God and says, they're telling the king this and you told me to tell him this. He said, God said to Jeremiah, they're not my prophets. You are. Tell them what I told you to tell them. In spite of it all. Then look at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 and verse 32. And when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul experienced it as well as some of the other apostles did. And they didn't like it, but some wanted to hear it again. They want, we, want to, we want to know more about this <clears throat> resurrection thing. But remember, some of them mocked. The poet has written, and this is a truth. The poet has written, tickle the people and make them grin. 
Tickle them more and you will win. Teach the people you'll ne'er grow rich, but live like a beggar in a ditch. The people made jest of everything he did and said. Daily here means all day long, Jeremiah preached the truth. He prophesied to them what God had told Jeremiah to tell the people. Sometimes God judges these mockers. Now, you know how Jesus said, don't discourage these little ones to come unto me. And anybody that mistreats them or misuses them, it would be better that the millstone was wrapped around his neck and cast into the sea. Well, here's what happened to these children who mocked the prophet. Look at 2 Kings chapter 2. And many of you know this story. Second Kings chapter two and verse 23 and 24. It's talking about Elisha and he went up from thence unto Bethel. And as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said unto him, go up thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. Now we know God loves his children. But he will not put up with such nonsense. Now I don't know where the parents were at this. They might have been mocking as well. Sometimes that's where the children hear it is from their parents. But God dealt with them. He got dealt with them in a harsh manner. Thirdly, he was indignant at their treatment. Look at verse 8 in our text there. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. He complained against the violence done to him for preaching the truth. Reproach for the word of the Lord was hard to bear. It is hard to bear. I've seen some falter under the truth. They don't, they don't want to argue with anybody anymore, so they actually will accept their false doctrine in order to get that, what they, you know, they don't want to do it anymore. And some quit because of that reason. Reproach for the word of the Lord was hard and is hard to bear. They should have honored and respected him for his office. Now, don't you understand that? It may not be the man, you may not like the man, but you better respect and have honor for the office. Instead, they reviled and reproached him. They said he preached too loud. Isaiah 58, 1, you don't have to turn there, but Isaiah 58, 1 says... Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. And he reproved them for violence and spoiled toward one another. So we're commanded to do that. We're commanded. And people don't want to hear two things. They don't want to hear about hell and they don't want to hear about sin. That's why we have all these so-called churches or organizations out there just, you know, making people feel good and preaching good things. 
because they don't want to hear it. Not only that, but they told lies on him. See, that, that it gets so so bad that they tell lies on him. And and I know he's not a preacher or anything, but he's he's he was the president of the United States, and he wants to be the president of the United States again. And what are they doing? They're telling lies on the president of the United States. Jeremiah twenty ten. For I heard the deframing of many fear on every side. Report, say they, and we will report it. All my families or familiars watched for my halting, saying, Preadventure. Pre he will be enticed and we shall prevail against him and we shall take over, take our revenge on him. Because they didn't like what he was preaching, because they didn't like what he was saying, they're going to go after him. It doesn't matter if it's the truth or not. It doesn't matter if our president, uh, President Trump was, was the best president we've ever had. It doesn't matter. They hate him with a passion. I mean, they're, they're saying right now, well, he could die. You know, maybe he'll die. Well, that's what they were saying about the prophet. That was what they were saying about Jeremiah. Maybe he'll just die. We don't have to worry about him anymore. Let's throw him in prison because that's what they did. The Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar came in to Jerusalem and took all of Israel captive. Where was Jeremiah? Well, he's in prison. You never know, Nebuchadnezzar told his, his soldiers, go let Jeremiah out. Go let him out. And he told the king, you should have listened to Jeremiah. Then in Psalms 31, 13, it says, For I have heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they devised to take away my life. And what happened to Jeremiah happens to many of us preachers. He was discouraged at the results. You don't think I get, do not get discouraged at the results of things that have transpired? Absolutely get discouraged. Faithful preaching had brought him only reproach. Why go on preaching to the people who do not want to hear it? See, that's kind of an excuse in the back of your head. Well, why do I keep doing this? And then I'm not doing any good. So Jeremiah said, well, I'm not doing any good, Lord. What's, what's the purpose? It's kind of what Jonah's cry was too, wasn't it? I'm not doing any, I'm not going to do any good. Why are you going to, you're going to kill them people. Why do I go to tell Nineveh to repent? Why do you want me to do that? You're going to kill them. Well, that's my business, Jonah. For right now, I want to save them. <laughs> you know, I want to see them repent. I want to save them. Yeah, and later on, yeah, when they get worse again, I'll, I'll take care of them. But that's not for now, see. You don't think Wes Jefferson's going to pay for their actions for us being here? You think God's just going to let them do whatever down the road? Every time you guys go out to preach the message, to give them an account, and they reject that account, will be their demise. Often God's servants feel they have labored in vain. Throw up my hands and say, what's the use? Jeremiah was not alone in weariness. Turn over to Exodus chapter 5.
Exodus chapter 5 and look at verse 22 and 23. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil and treated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? What in the world are you thinking? I mean, that's basically what Moses is saying to God. What was you thinking? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people. Neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. What am I doing here? See his frustration? You see the situ situation at hand and what's going on there? Look at Numbers chapter 11 and verse 15. Numbers 11 and verse 15, and he says, And if thou deal thus with me, this is Moses' complaint, and if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee. Out of, out of hand, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. And let's go where Brother Lonnie is. Joshua chapter 7 and verse 9. Joshua chapter 7 and verse 9. For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us around and cut off our name from the earth. And what will thou do? Do unto thy great name. Joshua was saying, wait a minute. We're just a mockery. Listen to them laugh. And I know Brother Lion's going to get into it eventually, but the destruction of Jericho. What do you think them people were doing on the wall when Israel was marching around and standing still and stomping up and down and blowing the trumpets and doing all this, and then they do it again? You don't think that that was funny to the inhabitants of Jericho? It was a sideshow. And Joshua was saying, my goodness. There's no respect here. How could, why? They're not going to fear us. What are we doing? Joshua, just like the rest of them, was sent to do a job. To do what God wanted him to do. Look at 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 uh, Kings chapter 19 Talking about Elijah here, or Elijah, yeah, 19 and verse 4. But he himself went a day journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. Lord, I'm tired. <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. And he said, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no, not better than my father's. So Moses and Joshua and Elijah and Jeremiah are saying, ah. I'm at the end of my rope. What am I supposed to do? You're telling me to do this, but I'm getting all this other stuff back. Then we see John the Baptist in Matthew eleven three. And then preach on I preached on this not too long ago, so you should remember. Matthew chapter eleven verse three and says, And he said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? John was in prison. John had time to think. I'm going to die. Is that really Jesus? Is that really the Christ? I got to know. 
But yet, John stood there and said, Behold, the Lamb of God had taken away the sins of the world. But now he's alone, locked up, know he's going to die, and now he doubts. We're just human beings, folks. Preachers are just human beings. Yeah, we have a grave responsibility. So don't ever think that we don't get down or we don't get discouraged. Jeremiah said his life seems like a failure. He is a disappointment and a defeated man. Here's what the congregation doesn't understand. Pastors mourn over their flock. Parents, their children. Employers, their employees. And teachers, their pupils. The teachers that I had that were worth anything, even in my rebellion helped me. I may have to get a whack or two, but they helped me. Those who gave me the worst weapons are those who I respected the most. Those who were stern to me, I respected the most. They were there for my benefit. The fifth thing we want to point out is he was inspired by the word there in verse nine. He said, then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. In other words, he could not stand still. He had the burning in himself. He had to get the word out, regardless of what was happening, regardless of the rebukes, regardless of those who were persecuting, regardless of those who wanted to kill him, regardless of those who wanted to fire him. By his word, God overcomes discouragement in the lives of his servants. We must speak when the truth comes like Liquid fire. Turn over to Job. We're going to look at a few verses of scriptures here. Look at Job chapter 32 and verse 18. For I am full of matter. The spirit within me constraineth me. That's why I keep going. That's why I do the things that I do. Psalm 39. People ask me all the time, and, and I've told this to you before. <laughs> you drive how far? You drive where? West Jefferson. Why, why so far? Because the Lord constraineth me. The Lord has given me a purpose here. Psalm 39, verse 2 and 3. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good. And my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me while I was musing. The fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue. Can't hold it in. You can't hold it back. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 and verse 20. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. This is what Peter and John answered them. They wanted them to stop preaching Jesus. No, we can't do it. We can't stop we heard it. We've seen it. We feel it. We know it. It's in our blood. And look at chapter 17 of Acts. In verse 6.
When they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. They're just turning heads. Where's this stuff coming from? What are they speaking? They turn the world upside down. They turn heads. Look at chapter 18 and verse 5. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. We're preaching that same message today that Jesus is the Christ and they want to persecute us. They want to kill us. There is a woe, though, there is a woe in not preaching the gospel. You don't have to turn there, but 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16 says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Understand what it says? If I preach not the gospel. If God opens a man's mouth, the devil can't shut it. He not only held the truth, but the truth held him. Jeremiah 23, 29, it says, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? He had an irresistible impulse, Jeremiah. He saw the awful misery of sin, shame, ruin, death, and hell, Jeremiah. He had the remedy for all human ills, Christ. The world may not want to hear that. They don't want to hear it, but that is. I, heard, I may have told you this. I was listening to a radio program on the way to the conference one time, and the guy called in. He says, I know the guy was calling in, and he was all upset. He had all these problems, and, you know, and the guy was trying to console him and everything, and the guy called in, and he says, I, I got the remedy for this man. He said, Jesus Christ. And the disc jockey said, Jesus Christ is not the answer for all things. Oh, but he is. Amen. Oh, but he is. <clears throat> the law at Sinai was a fiery law. Deuteronomy 33, 2. There was a cloven tongue of fire at Pentecost. Acts 2, 3. It was not a flame, but a fire. Lastly, he was encouraged. Jeremiah was encouraged by the Lord there in verse 11. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one. Therefore, my persecutors shall stumble and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. The God who called him was mightier and more terrible than his opponents. Romans 8, 31 says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? When his word burns like a fire in the bones, the mighty and terrible Awesome, that's what terrible means here, is awesome one is at hand. Look at over Jeremiah chapter 4. Or Nehemiah, excuse me, not Jeremiah. Nehemiah. Wrong direction. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 14. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. That's what we do. It's not just for us. 
We have family out there. We have daughters and sons and relatives that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. We got to tell them. You can't be silent with these things. God would baffle all the attempts of his enemies. The psalmist said it there in Psalm 27 2, when the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. God is actively concerned with human affairs. In conclusion of this, the life of a preacher involves danger, toil, and criticism. Doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. A true minister cannot quit preaching. And I'd say that to any person, any, any minister that retired, quit, whatever. He cannot keep silent. He cannot compromise or postpone. The love of Christ must be the constraining motive for his preaching. Better to burn at a stake than to have your life burned up by resisting God. They shall be greatly ashamed for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. May God bless his word to your heart today.